All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Rachel Fowley Newfeld. I'm the events coordinator for McNally Robinson Booksellers in Saskatoon. From this end, we're streaming live from Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of the Plains Cree, Soto, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota. Treaty 6 is also the homeland of the Métis Nation, one of Saskatchewan's founding peoples. I am so pleased you're all joining us tonight for the virtual launch of August into Winter by Guy Vanderheg. And although we weren't able to host this event in person, we really appreciate you all for joining us virtually. And thank you, of course, to Guy Vanderheg for being here tonight, as well as our host, Bill Robertson. I'd also like to extend our thanks to McClelland and Stewart and Penguin Random House Canada for working with us on tonight's event. So before I introduce our host for the evening, I have a couple of Zoom housekeeping items. Um, we've enabled live auto captions tonight, which you can access by clicking the live transcript button along the bottom of your screen. Um, we won't have an audience Q&A tonight, so I encourage you all to just sit back and enjoy the conversation between Guy Vander Haag and Bill Robertson. Uh, of course, you're welcome to use the chat function uh, to pass along any well wishes um, to Guy. At this point, I'd like to introduce our host. Bill Robertson is a poet, a freelance writer, reviewer, and broadcaster. He's published five collections of poems and the biography, Katie Lang, Carrying the Torch. He's also reviewed plays, books, and musical events for the Saskatoon Star Phoenix. And he uh, reviews plays and concerts for, or has reviewed plays and concerts for CBC Saskatchewan uh, for 15 years. He was also a regular panel panelist on the National CBC's Talking Books program for all of its 11 year tenure. And Bill also taught at the University of Saskatchewan until 2019 uh, when he retired. And we're so pleased he's here tonight to be in conversation with Guy Vanderhaag. So I'm going to pass it on to Bill Robertson. Welcome. Thank you, Rachel. And I uh, appreciate being here and a chance to, to talk with Guy about his new book, August Into Winter. Um, I will get right down to introducing Guy to a hometown audience. Um, Guy is, uh, as many people know, was born in Esther Hazy, Saskatchewan, down in the southeast in 1951. He uh, came up here to the U of S and did a couple of degrees in history. He then went to the U of R, University of Regina, and did a year of education. He uh, taught for one year in small town Saskatchewan, and uh, their loss was our gain. He decided that wasn't quite for him, and he uh, threw himself into to writing and has lived in Saskatoon most of the time since then, sometime in Ottawa. Uh, as many of you know, of course, uh, Guy is the author of four short story collections, the first of which, Man Descending, made a huge splash and uh, won numerous awards, including Canada's Governor General's Award. Um, he's published five novels, well, now six, but five before August into winter, and also two plays, per, uh, both of them produced, if you're lucky enough to see them, by Persephone Theatre here in Saskatoon. Um, and I think that. I think I'll, I'll leave it at that and just say welcome to Guy and uh, get him to uh, show himself. There he is. I've, I've clicked on. You've clicked on. Guy, welcome. And uh, Hi, from, from, from my, uh, one of my offices to yours um, in this virtual world of uh, pandemic book launching. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you take it away for a little while, Guy, and then we'll have our conversation. Well, I, I thought that I would begin by gi giving a very brief synopsis of a book uh, or the novel. It's almost 500 pages long, so the synopsis uh, will only be a thumbnail sketch. Um, so the novel begins in... August of 1939, with the world on the brink of war. Um, it's set in a small town called Connet, Saskatchewan. And for months before um, the opening of the 
of the book, the town has been beset by a series of bizarre break-ins. Uh, one of the RCMP officers in town suspects that a strange character by the name of Ernie Sickert is behind this. Uh, he arrests Sickert and Sickert murders the, the policeman uh, and takes off with a 12 year old girl that Sickert fantasizes as being the love of his life. Uh, the remaining policeman in town um, goes to two brothers, Oliver and Jack Dill, who are veterans of the First World War, enlists them in an attempt to track down Sickert, who's, who's um, uh, taken off um, in, in his mother's um, vehicle. Um, just as all of this is happening, a huge storm breaks. Um, a spectacular storm that sort of floods the landscape and makes traffic on the roads impossible, which isolates the town of Connet. Uh, the one policeman and the two brothers go after Sickert, uh, who has made it to the Quapel Valley. Um, when his car runs off the road, he goes to a one-room schoolhouse there where um, there's a, a newly hired school teacher from Winnipeg. Uh, has just arrived. Uh, she's a disgraced high school teacher who was fired for having an affair with, with a married, married man, who was also a communist who had gone to Spain to fight um, on the Republican side in the Spanish Civil War, uh, where he was killed. Uh, so she's sitting in Connet, Saskatchewan, thinking that this is the biggest disaster of her life. Um, when she encounters Sickert and Laura, uh, Loretta Pipe. More violence occurs um, in, in the, the Quapel Valley. The second policeman is killed by Sickert. Uh, the two Dill brothers escape with Vidalia Taggart and, and Loretta Pipe and manage to make it back to Connet, um, where Oliver Dill sort of extends aid to Vidalia Taggart, who no longer has a job and, and is, is, is broke. He finally goes back to the Coppell Valley and, and actually manages himself to capture Sickert. Um, um, Sickert is taken off to jail. Um, and a, a romance develops between uh, a very reluctant Vidalia Taggart who, who doesn't want to get mixed up with a man um, after her, her, her love affair with, with um, the fellow who had, who had died in the Spanish Civil War. Um, so the, the final bit of the novel uh, involves Ernie Sickert when he's being transported for trial, he manages to break free and and uh, then decides that that he's he's going to go and wreak vengeance on on um, the Dill brothers and Vidalia Taggart. Um, and as it opens, or as it has opened, the novel closes with a spectacular storm. Uh, it's Remembrance Day of 1939. There's a big Saskatchewan blizzard. And that's my rather rambling, rambling attempt to, to, to give a, a precy of the novel. I thought I would read just a very short bit of the novel, which introduces the character Oliver Dill. Um, uh, and he is actually, it opens um, on the day of the big storm. He was christened Oliver Dill but as soon as he began to walk, his father gave him the nickname Jumper because the kid had a habit of leaping before he looked. Peter Dill used to say of him, there's my boy, Jumper Dill, diving headfirst into the rocks again. He tended to disapprove of his son's reckless ways, but secretly he was pleased. Nevertheless, his pleasure in the Jumper's devil-may-care attitude diminished when Oliver's older brother Jack enlisted in 1916 and Oliver immediately followed suit, trooped off to war after Jack like he was the Pied Piper. Oliver Dill had always been stubborn, frequently kept to an intention whether it was wise or not. The morning of August 16th was a case in point. He had set that day aside to butcher a heifer. 
When he stepped outside and felt the full force of the heat and humidity, the sensible thing would have been to leave messing about in blood and gore for a cooler day, but Dill went ahead with the job anyway. By noon, he had finished skinning and gutting the animal. All that was left to do was to cut the carcass into quarters and haul them to the ice house. But time was running short. A big storm was brewing, getting ready to break. Dill watched the clouds rolling down from the north. They made him think of a mine disaster movie he'd seen years before, the tremendous explosion that had driven a burst of black smoke out of the mouth of the mine shaft and sent it swarming over the ground until the screen itself was swallowed up in sinister, writhing darkness. This was the kind of darkness advancing on him now. Thunder detonated with dull booms. Flickers of blue-yellow chain lightning played hopscotch along the horizon. The morning was dying. It was just short of midday and had gone and it had already gone twilight dark. The temperature was dropping, the sweat on his back congealing like grease in a cooling fry pan. A breath of rain whispered a few cold words against his neck. The air curdled, turned deadly still. Then a blast of wind gave a sharp whistle, nearly blew him off his feet, sent him ducking and dodging shingles ripped from the roof of a nearby granary that were swooping around his head like agitated bats shaken from their roost. A burst of rain drenched his clothes, molded them to his body like a second sad skin. Big drops pelted his eyes, half blinding him. But even half blinded, he caught a glimpse of his wife, Judith, standing on the back step of the big farmhouse, half hidden in a swirl of white smoky rain. She was looking for him, peering desperately into the downpour. Suddenly the wind died, the rain slackened, and in this window of stillness, he recognized that the dress Judith was wearing was the one that had caught his eye in that Calgary candy shop so many years ago, a butter-colored summer frock sprinkled with tiny black polka dots. Then he saw that the eye seeking him had the blank marble stare of a statue. Judith's dress was dry. Not a hair on her head had been ruffled by the wind. The storm hadn't touched his wife because she was beyond touching now. He ran toward her, even though he knew that she was beyond his touching too. Still he ran. The sky opened up once more, a curtain of water descended, separating him from his dead wife. He stumbled through the heavy beads of rain and into the house, stumbled from shadow throng groom to shadow throng groom calling out to the ghost of the woman he had surrendered so much of his life to. And then he realized that maybe he was well on his way to becoming just another head casualty, like his brother, Jack. Thank you, Guy. Uh, that's, uh, that gets us off to a pretty good start, I think. Um, I'm glad you also uh, told us the name Conant. Um, <laughs> I've been pronouncing it cannot for years. And uh, I, I'm, I swear if I was an academic, I would have tried to invest or freight it with can not, but uh, fortunately said Conant. Um, you've taken us back to Conant. We were there in 1959 in your novel, Homesick. And now we move 20 years earlier to 1939. Conant in 1959 was moving from a sleepy farm community to a, uh, well, it was going to be, well, it became, it was becoming a big mining community, potash mine. Now we're on the eve of something else that's huge. We're on the eve of the Second World War. Uh, conscious decision, obviously. Yeah, I mean, one of the things is, is that I think like a lot of writers um, who grew up in small towns, I, I actually used my hometown as a reference point. Mm -hmm. uh, in, to, to build my, my fiction from. And one of the things is, is that this, the beginning of this novel with the murder of the policeman is actually loosely based on an event that happened, happened in my hometown, Esterhazy, in August of 1939, in which uh, a young man from one of the better regarded families uh, had been breaking into into houses. Uh, he was arrested by the, the, the single policeman in town and killed by him. And then he went 
went on the run. So what happened then was that a posse of First World War veterans, according to my father, who told me this story, went after him. Um, when I was 10 years old, my mother took me to the RCMP Museum in Regina, in which they had on display the Stetson the, that the RCMP officer in Esther Hazy had been wearing when he was murdered with a big hammer dent in, oh. in the side of the Stetson. Um, and his wife had actually been a friend of, um, of both my mother and my aunt. Now, my story about, about what proceeds and even the character of the killer is far different. But in the back of my head, for now, you know, I'm 70 years old, for, for almost 60 years or, or, or 55 years, um, that was sitting there in my head. And then finally it gave me a push to write the novel that I, that I did. And, and so Conant in 1939 is roughly what Esther Hazy would have been in 1939. Now, of course, I take liberties. You right, know? Right. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm not attempting to detail the reality of a situation. Okay, all right. Now, going to your reading. By the way, I'm really glad that you gave the thumbnail sketch, man. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the thing that a reviewer is never allowed to do is give away certain key points you 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 let us in on quite a few of them which is uh, you know will be a relief to people who are worried about suspense um heart problems and such like that in your reading you show uh you, you show oliver looking back at the house and seeing his his wife and then he realizes that she's in the dress he saw her in when he first met her and you realize that he's looking at a, an illusion or hallucination and I want to move on to the head case part in a minute, but what I see in that reading alone is, is a man alone. And I, I see a, a, a guy Vander Haag person. Is, <laughs> yeah, I see, yeah, I see the loner. I mean, I see, I see, you know, Wesley Case and a good man all the way back to Charlie and the watcher from man descending. And and, you know, or, or Billy Dowd in Koenig and Company from your latest book of stories. And I see these, these people who are, who are alone. And in this novel, you've got a number of people, you know, I mean, in other places, you've got the loner, but you've got people who seem as if they're attached to society. In this book, you see, you've got the two Dill brothers, we didn't. We haven't met Jack yet, but my goodness, we we've got Vidalia, and we've got Ernie. These it's quite a quite a collection of of, of loners that you've got there. Do you want to comment on that guy? Well, I mean, one of the things is is that people who fit well into society often don't make great stories. No, um, it's it's those people who who operate on the margins, who may be slightly off kilter or be eccentric, or even if they're not eccentric, have, have um, a, a very strong notion of who they are and don't want to yield that notion to society. Um, I mean, I think historically and fairly typically that writers tend to be drawn to the exceptional. Yeah. There's a number of um, there's a number of fantastic writers who who uh, uh, would would counter that argument on on my part, uh, but often I think that it's exactly these sorts of characters that that actually propel fiction, um, and so in in this case, uh, uh, that's the focus of of, of the novel. But I would also add something else. I mean, I think that, they're, that, that all of these characters, though they may be loners, are actually seeking connection and love mm -hmm. um, as a way out of their, their solitariness. Um, so Oliver Dill, who's lost his wife, is looking for a reason to continue living. Mm -hmm. Adalia Taggart, who lost her husband, 
uh, not her husband, I mean, her lover in, in um, the Spanish Civil War uh, is trying to figure out her life and, and also trying to, even though she doesn't articulate this notion, to, to, to wonder if she can make a connection with somebody else again. So part of this is that people who are very alone and who are solitary, but who are also, I would say, in a very, you know, in a very direct and simple way, uh, are, are searching for, for the kind of love that might give their, their life meaning. Yeah, okay, all right. I, 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 I really like that. Now we move to the next part where... Oliver goes into the house and uh, he realizes as he searches the house for the wife, he all, I think he knows isn't there, but he's given yeah. it, a, he's given the house a darn good look. And this is a man who knows that his brother Jack is holed up in a hotel room back in Connet. And he, what we see is the loner and especially, I've seen it before in your work, and I see it very much in this, where the loner, as, as Oliver says of himself, is pushed all the way to where he wonders if maybe he's about to crack. And we, we meeting Jack, we know that Jack has cracked thanks to the First World War. And you approach that area of people who are either have a serious mental illness or are seriously, and I mean seriously, deluded. You know, people like Ernie, right. who, who is on, who has to be on the verge. I think of people like uh, Michael Dunn in Your Good Man. I think of, <laughs> I think of the genius Thompson in The Watcher. You know, these are the, and, and of course, Dan Cox Dance, if you want to go to one of your plays, we've got, you're edging into the sphere of, of mental illness, er, 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 Ernie Sickard's mother. And, you know, him not, I don't want to be the man of the house. So can you go there and, and talk about that place where we edge over from the loner who is interesting into, you know, moving, moving from the deluded to the seriously deluded to the completely mentally unhinged? Yeah, well, you know, this, this is... This is a difficult question for me because, you know, I'm, I'm probably at the age of 70 that I, I can now say it, um, that my mother's family and my mother herself suffered serious mental illness. Um, so I grew up um, in the presence of people who were, who, were, who were mentally ill. And so it's been a kind of preoccupation of mine um, examining it and looking at it and a actually asking questions about what it is to live with serious conditions like that. I mean, obviously, it's, it's often horrific. It's not necessarily horrific. In fact, um, Jack Dill has made a kind of, at least for a time, a kind of happy accommodation for himself yeah. Uh, yeah. by his mental illness sort of drifts off into, into, into religious mysticism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I look back at my work, you know, virtually every novel has one mentally ill person in it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's uh, like the, the biblical reference about a dog returning to its vomit. I, I, can't, I can't seem to avoid... Um, approaching that subject. Um, it's, it's something that I think uh, virtually, I can't, I can't speak for everybody, obviously, yeah. but I think that often all of us arrive at a point where we actually begin to worry about our mental health. Um, and so I think that in many ways, it is a universal question. I mean, just statistically, the, the, the fact about how prevalent mental illness is or types of mental illness me, actually define it as a human condition. Mm -hmm. And so as a human condition, I, I think that it's something that, that uh, writers uh, need to think about and, and uh, actually not push off to the side. I, I, I really like 
your revelation about that guy. I appreciate it, and thank you for that. I think that what you've said just um, sort of confirms what readers have long known, readers, serious readers of your work, and that is that you have a deep compassion for the mentally ill. They're not just, you know, as, as Oliver is starting to say, I'm just nutcase. I mean, Jack, Jack, in a way, his mind breaking on the fields of Cambrai saves him from a, a certain kind of complete collapse when the entire celestial vision opens before him after having murdered how many German soldiers, well, not murdered, it's, it's it killed so many German soldiers and then being caught by machine guns trying to get back to his lines. I mean, here's a man who, who basically breaks open. But you're, I see this compassion running, running all back through you know, you look at Sabrina Koenig and and young Dowd, Billy Dowd. I see, I see it particularly going back to Conant. Yeah. It's order to keep take, dragging us back there. But but Ernie, you know, brother Ernie, uh, in 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 homesick, who who is suddenly, you know, his father says, "We're going to make a man out of you," and I see your 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 deep compassion. I mean. And especially, especially with children, guy. I mean, the the young lad whose name I'm sorry I can't remember, whose drunken uncle comes up the stairs in the story in Daddy Lennon and says, you know, come and I'm going to kick a cigarette out of your mouth, and and you know, always waiting for the, the slam of the car door outside. The compassion that you bring to not just people who have to deal with the mentally ill, but the mentally ill themselves comes to the fore again in this novel, especially particularly in your, in your treatment of, of brother Jack Dill, who we haven't met yet, but you've described. Yeah, I mean, one of the things is, is that, that um, you know, the, 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 the mentally ill um, remain human. Yeah, yeah. You know? And, and the attempt is to recognize, I think, that common humanity that we all share. Mm. Um, and that no matter how it's disguised, whether it's disguised among, you know, people of, of, um, who are in some ways disabled or, 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 you know, don't share the same circumstances that you do, that might be of a different class or race or anything else. I have, I have a feeling that, that one of the things that, that writing can do, and I don't mean to be too idealistic when I say this, but I, I think that what it can do is it, it can give you a sense of what it is to occupy a space or a psyche that isn't your own. Yeah. Um, and for me, that's one of the important, important things about, about literature. And when I first began as a reader, as a child, uh, the first level was being transported to some place that was entirely different and exciting for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and as, as I grew older and read more wild, well, widely, it became a way of understanding people and the world and getting perspectives that I couldn't necessarily get in a small Saskatchewan town. When I say that, I'm not limiting the experiences in a small Saskatchewan town, but somebody living in a large metropolitan center like Toronto or London or New York are limited by that experience. Yeah, yeah. They haven't had the experience of, of, of living in a small Saskatchewan town, which is a very intimate experience. Yeah. So those are those are the things I think that have always intrigued me mm -hmm. as 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 a writer. Um, and the odd thing is is that when whenever I'm writing anything, I don't think I'm aware of what I'm writing. And then when it's finished and I look back, I can find an explanation or a reason for what I've or why I've, I've written the, the, the thing I've written. Um, and I think that's sort of a saving grace um, because otherwise 
I, I think it would be extraordinarily difficult to write if, yeah. if, you, if you were really kind of self-conscious about what your motives were um, um, and, and uh, uh, constantly analyzing yourself when you're involved in the act of writing. Yeah. All right. I want to circle around to something, but I want to go by way of, of <laughs> something we've been talking about. We're talking about talking about the the mentally ill here, and I want to I, and your compassion for them. I want to I want to lead in through a doorway that's about your compassion for children. I think of as I think you know in the past of other children that you've identified, whether it's Charlie and the Watcher or Billy Dowd or or Ernie and Homesick, and now. You know, a, a, a character that was barely mentioned so far is Loretta Pipe, and and even Ernie. I mean, Ernie in his last hours, I I think it's there's a certain compassion goes out for this rather challenged individual who has created so much mayhem. But Loretta reminds me so much of these poor waifs who have nothing but that tough exterior which conceals really no hope and so they you know the way she talks to the judge in her jail cell and and tries to act as if she's she's got all the power and uh and i i think of i think of kids i grew up with who who didn't have you know i thought they were pretty tough at the time and then you grow to realize that they don't have a whole hell of a lot and what I wanted to get to through that was talking about these waves is your whole look at, and it's something I see back through your work is abuse of power on, on the local level, whether it's a parent or in this case, you know, you, you, you let the cat out of the bag. So I'll say it. Ernie shoots a policeman, but that policeman was not a very nice guy guy. You know, he was, he's, he's, he's not a very great guy. And, there are other ways of handling Ernie Sickert than the way he did. And there you have abuse of power and you see it right back through your work. And so, and, and I, I'm, I'm going to want to move on to the global stage after that, but right. just, let's, go with, <laughs> let's just go with that for a minute. Well, you know, I mean, it's uh, Vidalia, Vidalia Taggart talks about, she's a school teacher right, right and the one thing that she talks about is like her sympathy for 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 kids who have nothing and and in some ways are disregarded or or bullied or picked on by authority mm-hmm. um so exercising power of any kind um whether it's the power of police or the power of teachers over children in a classroom, or even the power of of the strongest kid in the schoolyard over other children, if he chooses to to use that power, I think is kind of an essential human question. And and the abuse of power, um, in my mind, has become increasingly a problem in the in the modern modern world. Um, partly through technology, partly through the huge, you know, differences in economic circumstances with the rich getting richer and the poor getting pro- poorer, um, the problems of, I mean, we, we can do a whole list of things that, that are, are, are clearly an abuse of power. Um, I think that in some ways writers should stand with the defenseless. Yeah. And I, I don't mean that in a necessarily overt political way. What I mean is, is that what you attempt to do is, is, is demonstrate, and we talked about this earlier, the whole question of empathy, being actually able to understand someone who's, who's, who, is outside of your experience. So like when you talk about Ernie Sickert, Ernie Sickert is a psychopath. Yeah. Uh, He's a reprehensible person. Yeah. But at the same time, he has underneath all of that, again, what I would say, the basic human longings. Yeah. Right. 
He, yeah. he too wants to connect, but he's been the oddball in the town. He's the, he's, he's the strange guy that nobody wants to have anything to do with. There's a line in the novel in which when he's a compulsive runner, so yeah. he's continually running the streets of the town, which in like 1939 would be considered a very strange thing. And there's a mention about a little kid who waves to Ernie Sickert. And the kid is so small, he doesn't know that he shouldn't be waving yeah. to Ernie Sickert, which, which points out how isolated Ernie, Ernie Sickert is. Yeah. The, you know, Madame de Stahl once said, to understand all is to forgive all. I don't go that far. No. Right? <laughs> I, I, I'm not taking that step. But I also, I also believe that, that, that human... Human beings are shaded. Yeah. And, and that in that shading, we encounter, we are sometimes like absolutely surprised about either the strains of evil or the strains of goodness or, or, or anything, any other human emotion that, that, that we see whenever we encounter anyone. Yeah. Um, so, you know, after I've, I've been, well, publishing now for almost 40 years. <laughs> and I, as, as you obviously can, who, who you have know, like a stunning comprehension of my work. Sometimes when you're saying something, I'm trying to, I'm trying to drag up the name that you've just said and place who that person is. Um, that these, that often, you know, I think it was F. Scott Fitzgerald says that that the writer writes the same story every time he just writes it slightly differently. And I guess that's what I've been doing for 40 years, is yeah. that in some way I've been writing the same story with variations and, and a little twist uh, yeah. to it here and there. Okay, well, I'm, I've just got, I was showed the hook. And, uh, and it was a few minutes ago. So I'm going to end, I'm going to bring things to a close by saying this. Um, I think of the Dill brothers, Oliver and Jack, in 1939 in a small town in Saskatchewan who went to the First World War and gave more than everything they had and came home without many of the people that they went there with. And I think of how they must look at, you know, you've got all these little snippets from the Winnipeg Tribune of Mr. Hitler doing this. And you can, we with retrospect, see it coming closer. And I can see how Oliver just doesn't even want to look at it. I mean, 20 years, 21, if you want to be accurate. And they say, good God, is it coming round again? And I look at this novel of yours guy and we'll close here, but you know, all the talk that you do of fascism, and and on and the, and the journals of Dove, Vidalia's lover in the Spanish Civil War, trying to hold off the, the powers of fascism. And what we've seen rising with the, the answer of the strong man in, in our 21st century. And I see you layering that into your novel in such a terrific way, in and amidst a suspenseful story. Just we'll end here and just comment on that, if you will. Okay. I mean, um... I don't think of myself as a political writer, but for 10 years, I have been disturbed by the, the rise of the radical right. I'm not talking about conservatism here. No. I'm, talking, I'm talking about something entirely different. And you, can, you, 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 know, you see it in, in Europe with Orban and in Hungary, right. with Duda in, in Poland. We've seen Trump. Um, we've... There's Duterte in, in, in the Philippines, uh, Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro in Brazil. Yeah. Um, in, last thing I'll say, when I was a history student in 1972, if someone had said to me that communism would be dead in terms of that the Soviet Union would no longer be communist, communist and that, that the Iron Curtain would collapse, I would have said, you're crazy. If they had said to me that fascism was was going to be making a comeback, I would found 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 that even more difficult to believe. 
Exactly. Because I would have thought that that everybody, okay, would would have have seen that the Holocaust, the Nazis, in the second uh, Second World War would have made fascism an unten- untenable political ideology. Right. But it isn't. And I think that we're, it's not the same crisis. And, you know, we're, we're not sitting in 1939, I hope to God, facing some sort of um, global war. But I think within our own societies and nations and communities, there is, there is a real threat from the radical right. Yeah. And, and that disturbs me. All right. Guy, this has been terrific. And thank you so much uh, for, this, for this conversation and, uh, the, and the discussion of your new novel. Uh, I see by the chat lines running down the side that people have been uh, bringing in comments that you might want to look at later. I think I will too. And uh, it looks like a lot of people want to pick up a copy of your book and continue the, the discussion on their own at home. So thank you again, Guy. And thanks to McNally for, for putting or for sponsoring this on and to, uh, to your publisher, uh, Penguin Random House. Uh, thank you, Bill. I mean, I, I, must, I must admit my astonishment of your familiarity with with uh, my uh, 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 many years of writing, and uh, I really appreciate the 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 background that you 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 brought to this conversation. So thank you very much. You're very welcome, guy. It was a pleasure. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Bye, Bye everyone. All right. Um, Thank you so much uh, to both of you for being here tonight. Thanks, of course, um, to Guy Vanderhag and to Bill Robertson, as well as all of the folks at McClelland and Stewart and Penguin Random House Canada. Uh, and last but not least, I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us tonight on behalf of McNally Robinson. Uh, we would, of course, encourage you to purchase a copy of August into Winter um, from McNally Robinson, either online at McNallyRobinson.com or in store. Uh, We appreciate your support uh, so much and look forward to being able to safely host in-person events again. Um, But until then, please keep an eye on our coming events page to find out more about our upcoming virtual offerings. All right. Good night, everyone. Stay safe. Good night. Thank you. Good night. night.